Hello there, my name is Dr. Ominde and I'm going to uh, do an introduction of the nervous system using Professor Bigby's um, um, lecture. So just to begin, um, there's a need for the nervous system in the body, yeah? Remember the tissues together uh, that subserve a common function form an organ, and organs that subserve a common function form an organ system, and all these are regulated by the nervous system with an aim of maintaining the organism at an optimal state. The body is also exposed to different environmental conditions, both internally and externally. Therefore, with a good nervous system, it's able to respond and adapt to ensure survival. Then the nervous system is also required because you need to be able to coordinate and integrate um, how the nervous system works as well as the endocrine system. Therefore, that forms the neuroendocrine system. So what are the components of a nervous system? The main component is the neuron, which is a structural and functional unit of the nervous system. It has two characteristics. It's excitable, therefore it's able to be activated and also has conductivity, whereby it's able to propagate an impulse. The neuron has three domains, a receptive domain that receives signals, integrative domain that interprets the signal, and a transmission domain that carries the impulse. The receptive domain is a dendrite, it receives the signal. Integrative uh, domain or the trophic center, which is the cell body, interprets the signal. And then the axon is the transmission domain. So you should be able to draw the structure of a neuron, the dendrite, cell body, axons, which are myelinated and have the nodes of run via the gaps that are unmyelinated. So the neuron is a basic structural and functional unit of the nervous system and it has this part, a dendrite that uh, receives the impulse and carries to the cell body, an axon that carries impulses away from the cell body, and there's a myelin sheath which is um, the glial cells that wrap their cell membrane around the axon of a neuron. Then we have a synaptic terminal at the end where neurotransmitters are, are released, could be epinephrine, norepinephrine or acetylcholine to a neighboring neuron. So we have different uh, nerves. We have uh, nerves that carry sensory information from the uh, uh, parts of the body to the brain. That that's those are afferent. And then we have motor neurons that carry the message from the brain to effector organs, which could be muscles or glands. Those are efferent, and associates are able to um, cause the inter. Um, it, interaction between sensory and motor, so they perform both roles. So this is just a neuron and the presence of neuroglial cells. You can appreciate the cell body, the dendrites, and the axons. We have neuroglial cells. These are cells that ensure a good physical and metabolic environment for the neurons. So we have different examples. In the central nervous system, we have the astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, microglial cells, and epidermal cells. While in the peripheral nervous system, we have Schwann cells and neurosatellite cells. So generally, the nervous system is divided into two, the central nervous system made up of brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system made of nerves that exit the brain, the cranial nerves, and nerves that exit the spine, the spinal nerves. You can divide the nervous system into uh, central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. Central nervous system divided into brain and spinal cord. Peripheral nervous system is divided into somatic and autonomic. Autonomic is divided into sympathetic and parasympathetic. Remember, somatic goes to the skin and skeletal muscle mainly, and autonomic is mainly onto cardiac and smooth muscles as well as glands, and they're divided into sympathetic and parasympathetic. Somatic is voluntary. Autonomic nervous system is involuntary. So central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, while the cranial nerves, the peripheral nervous system has um, 12 pairs of cranial nerves and 31 pairs of spinal nerves. So the central nervous um, system generally remember the process of neurulation to originate from the ectoderm where notochord induces the overlying ectoderm to form a neural plate that gains the folds and the folds approximate come towards each other and form a neural tube. So this neural tube eventually, the cranial two thirds will form the brain and the um, caudal a third will form the spinal cord. So the cranial two thirds will give us the primary vesicles where you have the rhombencephalon forming the hindbrain, mesencephalon forming the midbrain, and the prosencephalon that forms the forebrain. So remember, the notochord induces the overlying ectoderm to form neural plate that will develop a groove, and the upper portions will have a fold. Then the folds will approximate, and the neural crest cells 
will drop. These are the neural crystals. So the cranial two thirds from the brain, the caudal third from the spinal cord, and then you're left with a neural tube that has a cranial neural pole and a caudal neural pole. The cranial neural pole of the neural tube closes on day 25, then two days later on day 27, the caudal neural pole closes. So the primary vesicles include prosencephalon, which is the forebrain, which will form the telencephalon that gives the cerebral hemispheres and the diencephalon. Uh, then the mesencephalon is another primary vesicle that will give the midbrain, while the rhombocephalon gives the hindbrain um, 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 derivatives which are divided into the myelencephalon that will give the medulla oblongata and the metencephalon that gives the pons and the cerebellum. So remember the brainstem is formed by midbrain, pons and medulla oblongata. So again, your primary vesicles, we have three, the forebrain, prosencephalon, midbrain, mesencephalon and the rhombocephalon that gives the hindbrain. Then what are the secondary um, vesicles? Forebrain gives telencephalon and diencephalon. Mesencephalon remains, and the rhombocephalon gives metencephalon and myelencephalon. What are the derivatives of these five secondary vesicles? Telencephalon will give you the cerebral hemispheres, which contains lateral ventricles. Diencephalon will give you the thalami, hypothalamus, metathalami, epithalami, which give, uh, which also the diencephalon also gives the third ventricle. Then we have the mesencephalon that gives a midbrain containing the aqueduct. Then metencephalon that gives pons and cerebellum which form the upper part of the fourth ventricle and the myelencephalon that gives you the medulla oblongata where we also have the lower part of the fourth ventricle. So the, the walls, the blue part, the walls will give you these derivatives while the white part, which is the cavity, so the blue will give you the walls, uh, are the walls, so the derivatives of the walls are this here and the white, the cavity of the neural tube will give you the cavities which are from, uh, where the ventricles are in generally where CSF um, is found. So again, these are the primary vesicles. You have three, then you have five secondary vesicles, telencephalon, diencephalon, mesencephalon, metencephalon, and myelencephalon, and then the wall structures and the cavity structures. So again, these are the parts of the brainstem. You have, um, sorry, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. Then the brain itself, you have the cerebrum, but in between the two cerebrum, we have the diencephalon where you see your thalamus and the hypothalamus. The cerebellum is separated from the brain by this transverse fissure here. So then we have the spinal cord. It's usually the caudal continuation of the brainstem, extends from foramen magnum to L1, L2, and functionally it's segmented. So there's usually a pair of spinal nerve from each segment. So we have different segments of the spinal cord, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal. So cervical, we have eight. Remember, we have seven cervical vertebra, but the first nerve exits above the first cervical vertebra. So eventually you'll get eight nerves. So we have cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral. How does the spinal cord develop? So the wall of the neural tube, remember our neural tube that has formed, the lower third forms the spinal cord. So the wall is usually lined by pseudostratified epithelium made up of neuroepithelial cells. So here it is. Then these neuroepithelial cells will rapidly divide. Okay. So when they divide, the neuroepithelial cells will give rise to primitive nerve cells, which you call the neuroblasts. So these neuroblasts will form mantle layer. This is the gray matter, the inner part of the spinal cord. Okay, so this mantle layer is around the neuroepithelium. So imagine your neural tube. This neural tube has a pseudostratified epithelium made up of neuroepithelial cells. Then they give rise to neuroblasts. This neuroblast form a mantle layer around the neuroepithelial layer. So this mantle layer will develop a dorsal, an ala plate that gives you a dorsal horn and a basal plate that gives you a ventral horn. Then in the um, thoracic and upper lumbar region, there will be an intermediate horn that will be formed, and this usually contains the sympathetic origin. So T1 to T12, then up to L1, L2, L3. That's the origin of sympathetic in the body. They come from an intermediate horn. So you have three horns. Um, ala plate gives you dorsal horn, basal plate gives you ventral horn, but in thoracic and upper lumbar, there's an intermediate horn. Then the outermost layer of the spinal cord, innermost is the mantle layer, outermost is the marginal layer, that's where the white matter is. So it contains myelinated um, fibers, okay, of this neuroblast. 
So this is what we mean. This was your initial neural um, tube with a neuroepithelial layer. Then you form neuroblasts that migrate and first form the mantle zone, which is gray matter. This mantle zone will be divided into ala plates that form dorsal horns and basal plates that form ventral horns. And then in the thoracic and upper lumbar, you have an intermediate horn where the origin of sympathetic is. Then these neurons, the cell bodies are in the mantle layer. As they exit, the axons are myelinated. Those myelinated fibers of these neural cells of the mantle layer are what will form the marginal layer. So we go to peripheral nervous system. We've said it's made up of cranial and spinal nerves and it's divided into somatic where you have 12 uh, cranial nerve pairs and 31 pairs of spinal nerves and then you also have autonomic nervous system made up of sympathetic sympathetic is for fight and flight when you see a lion how your body responds to that that fear that's sympathetic then we have parasympathetic so then we an introduction we have 12 cranial nerves you need to know all the 12 cranial nerves in order they are located at the base of the brain so you have olfactory there followed by optic, then oculomotor. So olfactory is on the, uh, sorry, the optic is at the level of the diencephalon, then the um, from oculomotor onwards, they are the brainstem. So third nerve is oculomotor followed by trochlea, then trigeminal, then abducens, hair, uh, facial, vestibular cochlea is number eight. Before you get to glossopharyngeal, okay, vagus, accessory, so 9, 10, 11, and then 12 hypoglossal. So that's the order of the 12 cranial nerves. And you need to know the functions of each. There will be a lecture of each of the 12 cranial nerves. Then we have spinal nerves. They come from, initially we have dorsal. You can see from the dorsal horn, you have dorsal root, which is sensory. From the ventral horn, you have motor root, which is motor. Then they join together and form a spinal nerve. So spinal nerve is both motor and sensory. Then this spinal nerve will divide into two, a dorsal ramus to supply muscle and skin on the dorsal aspects of the limbs and the body, and the ventral ramus, which is also mixed motor and sensory, to supply the structures on the ventral aspect of the body. So the ventral rami form adjacent segments. Usually they will combine to form the brachial plexus. Then we have what you call a dermatome. What's a dermatome? It's a specific skin region that's innervated by a single segment, okay? And sometimes dermatomes do overlap. So when you are doing anatomy of the limbs and the thorax, you saw this, the dermatomes. Then an introduction of the autonomic nervous system, we have said it's involuntary and controls smooth muscles and glands. Then you need to understand that there is um, communication with the central nervous system. From the central nervous system, there's a preganglionic fiber they communicate with the postganglionic fiber within a ganglion, and then the postganglionic goes to the effector organ. So we have three components of autonomic nervous system. You have the sympathetic, parasympathetic, and enteric nervous system that controls the GIT. So you need to remember that the control is at the CNS, but there's a ganglion where information is transferred, and we have two neurons, preganglionic from CNS to the ganglion, postganglionic from the ganglion to the effector organ. So again, uh, CNS, brain and spinal cord, then PNS, you have somatic and uh, um, ANS. So you can see how the information gets to somatic, skeletal muscle, then autonomic, you have smooth cardiac muscles and glands, then enteric nervous system involves the GI. So parasympathetic, both pre and post ganglionic fibers will travel with cranial nerve 3, 7, 9, and 10, and also some small sacral component. So parasympathetic origin is craniosacral. Cranial nerve 3, 7, 9, 10, okay, and the small portion of sacral. And then sympathetic is thoracolumbar, where the lateral horn was T1 to T12, L1 to L3. So preganglionic will arise from thoracic and lumbar segments and travel with the ventral roots, and then postganglionic fibers reach the target, either they go directly or they may hitchhike on another spinal nerve or cranial nerve, or they may form a plexus of vessels to get to their target organ. So these are the three ways in which postganglionic will reach their target. Then we have a reflex that has four components. There's the receptor, which feels whether it's heat or temperature, then it will send, uh, transduce that stimuli into an, and, and send it to a neuron. The neuron will take that information to the integratory site, which is the brainstem or spinal cord, and then we'll have an effector organ 
that will get that information from the spinal cord to cause a response. So those are the four components, receptor cell, neuron, integrating site, and effector organ. So this is the receptor, this is your afferent, the integratory site, brainstem or spinal cord, that's your effector, that's your efferent, then effector organ can be muscle or gland. So that's the reflex pathway receptor, afferent to the spinal cord, efferent to muscle or gland, which is the effector.